so powerful, huh? Yeah, so I watched that video like five times because the first four times I watched it, I cried at the end. And then, um, then we watched the Kate video and I was already crying and so I couldn't help myself and had to turn my microphone off so I could sniff and all those things. Hey, welcome. It's so good to see everyone. For those who I have not met, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at New Covenant. And we're so glad you're with us today. You know, um, what I love about that video is I think, I think we can all admit that regardless of, of maybe how much we've enjoyed working from home or how introverted we are, it's been a hard year. And I was reflecting back that a year ago, we were recording this online um, and, and, and the process of going through that and that was kind of new for us at, as a church at the time. And so I, I show that video for two main reasons because we're gonna get into this story of the resurrection, the empty tomb. And the two main reasons are this, is one, um, what it must have been like for the disciples going into Sunday morning. It gets real easy sometimes when we look at stories in the Bible and we jump to the end, when we know how it's going to finish and we don't pause and think about what it was like for them in the moment. And and as they go to the tomb on resurrection morning, even as they go and they're trying to figure things out, they're, they're, they're lost, they're still confused. Matter of fact, the text we're gonna look at says they still had a hard time understanding it. And then the second thing is, I think it's good for us to recognize that Jesus can overcome anything, anything. Even our moments where we feel this emptiness, where we feel this loss, or we feel this, this, this grieving, that Jesus can come and overcome all of that. So we're gonna look at one of the gospel accounts this morning. If that word gospel feels churchy to you, let me explain what gospel means. It literally means good news. And good news, we as followers of Jesus will tell you that good news is not rest in a story, but rest in a person, rest in Jesus. And that as we look at this account this morning, I wanna give you just a little bit if I can, um, I'm gonna try not to get too much of seminary professor on you for a second, but I think it's important to think about the way the scriptures were written and even the ways that they, the early disciples were still trying to figure things out. So we're gonna look at the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was written about 50 or 60 years after this event. Now what's really powerful about that is the Gospel of Mark, the first one written, was written about 20 or 30 years after this event. See, the early church thought that Jesus was gonna come right back. And you have to realize that when he, he, comes, he comes back from the grave, that for those, those next days, he's kind of in and out. He's popping in and out. So even when he ascends to heaven, they're kind of sitting there going, well, he'll come back, right? Because that's what they would have assumed. Their perspective was, he's coming right back. So I think what's unique about the Gospel of John and the way that John explains the, the resurrection, the empty tomb story, is that he's writing it now towards the end of his life. He's the only one left. All of these places where they had been able to share stories with people orally, tell the story, he's realizing I don't have much time. I, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of gaps in these stories. I need to go back and refill. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, we're going to go to John 20, and I just want to say my my prayer this morning as we head to John 20 is that it can be easy to go. Well, I know the story. Jesus was dead, and now he's alive. Uh, okay, great. That's true. But what I'd like to do is I'm hoping maybe we gain a new perspective on the story this morning. I'm hoping maybe we see something we haven't seen before. I'm hoping maybe it speaks something about our own journey of faith, okay? I'm gonna pray real quick. We're gonna dive in. We're gonna go to John 20. So Lord, you are good. You are good. And we are so thankful that in the midst, in the midst of maybe one of the craziest years I've ever experienced, that your faithfulness does not go away, that you are consistent in your faithfulness. And Lord, I pray this morning that as we, we celebrate your resurrection, we celebrate your victory over death, we celebrate your redemption story, that Lord, maybe you would speak something new to us and help us see the way we engage with you in a different way. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're gonna go to John 20. I am reading out of the ESV this morning. We will have words on screen if you want to uh, follow in my exact translation or you're welcome to open up whatever Bible app you have or I know there's some people actually physically carry Bibles, well done. So John 20, starting in verse one. Now on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. All right, let's pause here for a second. Let me give you a little bit of context of what's going on. Uh, Obviously, this is after Jesus has been crucified and then buried. The way tombs worked in that day was you would put a body in a tomb with all these kinds of of, of perfumes and, and scents and the body would stay in the tomb for a year and then a year later you'd come back, roll the stone away and take the mostly bones that are left and bury them. Does that make sense? So the, they let the bodies decompose over that time. And there was actually kind of this thing in first century Middle Eastern world where grave robbers would go to these tombs because people would pack up all the belongings with folks and they would go and try to steal things. So for Mary to come, we know that when she says they have, they have taken him and we don't know where they've laid him, she's actually thinking at this point, somebody stole the body of Jesus right? And where we would go, who would, want, who would want to do that? But that's why. Because in that day, people were buried with things, with their physical possessions or material possessions, and people would go steal them. So in this moment, Mary gets to the tomb, the stones rolled back, which by the way, it has to be rollable or else it wouldn't have gotten there in the first place, right? So, so let's just get there. So somebody, somebody physically could have done that or, or a bunch of somebody's. And so Mary shows up and she goes, okay, he's not here. She goes running back and tells Peter and the disciple who Jesus loved. Now, John, John, God bless John. So imagine, if you will, what it was like when you hang out, when you hung out with your grandfather when you were younger. Or maybe even like what it's now. You ever hang out with people who are advancing towards that moment where they're going to be with Jesus. I have people look at me being careful, say, be careful. I see you. I see you, Cindy. So she's saying, be careful. What do I say now? But uh, we had, we used to run into some of this with my father, especially when he was really sick, that he would tell the same stories over and over again. You might know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, we all do it, right? We all do it. We all have our favorite stories that we can't wait to tell. But John is at this age where he's getting close to his time to be with Jesus forever again, and he's telling these stories. And so we have to cut John a little slack that when he describes himself as the one that Jesus loved, there's nobody around to argue with him. (laughs) Right? All the other 11 are gone. Who are they to say, right? At this moment in time, John is the one who Jesus loved because he's all that's left. So, no, I actually think that if we look at that, it really should describe the way we all see ourselves. We are the ones that Jesus loves. And that John probably at this point in his life finally had it right, where he identified himself completely through the name of Jesus, not through his own name, okay? All right, so that's the empty tomb. So let's move on, verse three. So Peter went out with the other disciple, aka John. He never uses his own name in his own story. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, you got there. Didn't need any help with that one, I appreciate that. Let's point, let me just point out, we, we have said that we think John was a teenager, which is why he was the only one who went to the cross because he would not have been arrested for a conspiracy and hung on a cross, okay? Peter's an old man. I don't know how old he is, but he's married. He's been sitting on a boat for lots of years. Probably not as fit as he once was, right? It happens. Of course the teenager's gonna outrun some guy in his 30s, right? It's gonna happen, all right? So way to go, John. All right. And then verse five. And and stooping to look in, he, John, saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, 
and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head lying, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, okay, here he is again. Just remind you, I was faster again. Also went in and, and, when, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture. This is the key part, I want you to see this. That if for yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. Okay, the tomb's open. There's no body. If the grave robbers had taken the body, they would have taken everything. They'd have taken the cloth and the linens and all that stuff too. They walk into the tomb, it's empty. And they admit, John admits all these years later, he's looking back now. We, we know he's prone to a little bit of like telling the story from his own angle, right? I mean, he is faster than Peter and he made sure we knew it twice, okay? But in this moment, in this case where it really matters, he admits they had no idea. We didn't know. We thought we knew, but we didn't know. Hey, before we move forward, I just wanna pause here for a second. I don't know what your journey of faith is like. I don't know what your relationship with Jesus is like. Here's what I would say, is there is all kinds of room not to fully understand. Jesus is not, he's not bothered by our questions. He's not bothered by our doubt. He's not bothered by the wrestle. These 11 guys had no clue until the Holy Spirit fell on them at Pentecost what in the world was happening. And yet, Jesus walked with them for three, for three years they walked with him. Hey, you can walk with Jesus a long time and not get it. It's why we call it a journey of faith, not a destination, okay? All right, I wanna go back and look at these, these verses again, then I'm gonna look at them a little closer. What's always fascinating for me, and, and sometimes the Greek doesn't help you, it kind of messes you up and you get, get down these little rabbit holes and you get all weird. But the Greek in this case actually is really powerful because there's three different times the word saw, S-A-W, as in see with your eyes, is used. But there are three different words. And so I want to go back and look at these three different words, all right? So John 25, and stooping down, he, John, saw the linen cloth lying there but did not go in. This word is, I'm, I, I would try to pronounce it, but we'll all just laugh at me. So it means it's this physical way of looking at something to see, to watch, to pay attention. So John's initial foray into the tomb means he physically saw what was happening, okay? That's all he's got at this point, right? So it's a physical approach. Verse, verse six, then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen's cloth lying there. Here's another word. This one's a little bit easier, easier to say, theore. And it's a mental approach, right? It's where we get the, it's the root word for some th theory, okay? It's this mental approach to see, to look at, to watch closely, to perceive, to experience. So he looks in, he doesn't just see the cloths and go, huh, Jesus' body's missing. And there's cloths there. He actually goes, I think this means something. Right? So in a mental way, he's approaching this moment. And then the third one, maybe the most important. Then the other disciple, again, John, the one that Jesus loved, who's faster than Peter, who had reached the tomb first, again, also went in and he saw and believed. And this word really does give a spiritual connotation. It's this idea that he realizes something's going on. So the first C is saw with the eyes physical approach the second C is saw with a, an understanding a mental response the third C is they saw with their heart so where are you in your journey of faith because there's lots of people who say lots of good things about Jesus and recognize the way that he taught. There were crowds of people following him all over Galilee. And yet, when it comes to the upper room, there's only 120 left. He fed 15,000 at one sitting. He said he fed 12,000 at one sitting. He healed people left and right. There were crowds crying out, calling out his name, as Amelia talked about last week. But at the day of Pentecost, there was 120 left. The ones who didn't just see, 
physically or even mentally approach, but actually got here. They got here with their heart. Something in their heart said, I'm all in, and I have no idea what that means. I would contend that that is the challenge for us this morning. That that's really what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And as we are figuring it out, there's room to go from physical to mental to heart, but that's the journey he's calling us on to. He's saying, I want all of you. I don't want just your intellect. I don't, want you, I don't want you just to think about me in a certain way. I don't want you just to recognize that, yeah, I had some good things to say and maybe there's some good moral code I should be living by, but I want your heart. I want all of you. I'm gonna finish with this last text and it's a beautiful, beautiful finish of the story because one of the things I think is so interesting about this story is Peter and John, they run there, right? John outruns Peter. They run there, they get there, they look in, they see everything, and then just go home. And they leave poor Mary there, all by herself. She's still confused. She's upset, she doesn't know what's going on. So let's look at what happens with Mary in this moment. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stopped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, I'm gonna pause. How powerful is this that those angels don't appear to Peter and John? That they appear to Mary? That in this moment, they appear to a non-male Jew which in that society means of the last person who had believed. That this is who the angels appear to. I think it's a beautiful moment. I think, it, I think it's God's continuing response to Mary and her heart that she keeps coming to, to Jesus with all of who she is all the time. It's the same Mary who pours all the stuff over Jesus that Sean talked about last month. Same Mary who's weeping the loss of her brother Lazarus comes running out. Jesus meets her in their weeping and her grieving. This Mary is the first one to encounter the supernatural in this moment. Having said this, verse 14, she turned and saw Jesus standing, but did not, did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? <laughs> Supposing him to be the gardener. Hmm. How often do we miss, miss see Jesus? She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. I think some of you just need to hear Jesus call your name. Let me rephrase that. I think we all just need to hear Jesus call our names. There's power in that moment. So let me share a last couple things. I'm just gonna, we're just gonna pray together. Scripture talks about the good news, the gospel message is really this, is that one, sin has separated us from God. Romans 3.23 talks about we've all sinned. And then John 3.16, everybody's uh, first verse they ever learned when they were in children's ministry is God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus, his only son, that if we believe in him, we will not perish, have everlasting life. And then John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So on this journey of faith, I'm just gonna say a simple prayer, and I would invite you to pray with me. Even if you've prayed this a thousand times, let's make it a thousand and one. It's a good way for us to reaffirm that Jesus is it. And my prayer for you is that you will hear him call your name. Okay? 
So Lord Jesus, please forgive me my sins. Please come into my life even more and cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. Jesus, I ask you to be Lord of my life. I commit to serve your kingdom. Thank you for your gift of redemption. Amen. If you have prayed that for the very first time, please let us know so we know how to journey with you and help you figure out how to have this faith journey with Jesus. And we're going to worship a little bit more.